You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and over there is Matt Reynolds. And it's Thursday, and we're going to record a question and answer session here. Thursday is my recording day. Oh, you just knock out tons of podcasts? I just do. I just, it's almost eight hours straight of oh, just man. recording. That wrecks me, though. I'm so tired when I do that. It's it's mentally and emotionally. It's not like physically exhausting. It's, it's emotionally just, and your exhausting. Voice because you put yourself out there so much. No, it's just you just talk so much. And I tell you what, my ears start hurting wearing these earphones all day. It's got that Shrek head. You need like an extra large set of headphones with like a, hey, man. you need to splice another piece of, of like that band that goes across the point on the top of your Is head. That what there. I need? Yeah, so it doesn't squeeze I about your it. ear I just so need hard. To wire, I just need to put my use my microphone for my for my audio and then just do my earbuds for my. I don't. I'm not a producer. I don't need to hear this thing in the headphones. I can just right. run it th- right to my ear earbuds. It'll be fine. Uh, but, are your earbuds extra big to fill that big old hole? That big old no, ear I, hole. I don't. I have a small. I'm a. I have a very tight ear canal. You have the dainty, <laughs> tight. Ear, yeah. Ear orifices. Matter of fact, I can't. I can't wear the Apple ones. I, those things are uncomfortable. I don't like them. I get the Jabra Elites. Jabra Elite seventy five T. That's what I got for the earbuds. I, I like. That. I love my earbuds. But even the AirPod Pros with the little rubber tip that didn't fit my ear. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I got one here from Zachary. Okay. Let's it says, it. Is it good? It or? says Hobbit issues. Hmm. I have the exact opposite problem. This guy's going to say his foot's too wide. What kind of squat shoe does he need for wide feet? Is that the question? Uh, you know, uh, kind of, maybe. Not, not, okay. not, not so much about I mean, his I'm feet. I'm just guessing. He says, I've been listening to the show for a long time. I found out about you from Art of Manliness, and I'm now working on the great books because of online great books. There you go. There you go. He says, I love how all the different worlds come together. I listen to a lot of the Q&A episodes, and I'm getting annoyed with people writing in, I'm six foot, whatever, less than 200 pounds, blah, blah, blah. It's not that hard to eat more food, he says. I'm 30. I'm 5'4", 435 pounds. (laughs) I'm 30 years old, 5'5", 210, pulling 425. He says, I'm a hobbit. If you are over six foot, your LP probably finished where I'm grinding. That's all I've got. No actual questions. (laughs) <laughs> Love the show, especially the random guys sidebars. Just trolling all the tall, skinny guys. All right. Uh, there you go. Uh, five, five. If you're into powerlifting and you're a dude, uh, five, five, two, ten is probably where you want to be, actually. Yeah. 220 class. Fill out that 220 class at five, five. Yeah. Or maybe one, or cut down to the 198s. Walk around at 210, 212 and make weight at 198. Yeah. That's a big boy. No, five, five is good. Like your, your deadlift lockout is half of mine. Sure. The range of motion on your squats, half of mine. I might be six two, but uh, pound for pound and inch for inch, you probably are going to move more weight than any of the rest of us. Yep. You know my my old business partner William Neely. He's he was five four, little Guatemalan guy, El Salvadorian. I was close. El Salvadorian is what he was. Anyway, he uh, he benched he benched four ten in a meet, paused at at. I can't. I think it was 165, and I don't. It could have been 181 class. He always tried to make the 165. So if he was a 181, he might have weighed 167 or went and missed weight. It happens sometimes. He'd miss weight at 165. He'd go in at 167 or 168, and then bench 410. Paused, raw, no bench shirt. But he's five four. Right. You know, so it's like a little little T Rex arms. Just yeah. So uh, cone. Five four, right? Five four, five five. He's, two, he's five 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 six, probably. He's, he's two forty two at one point. Uh, yep. He also he also he did that enor- those enormous that enormous squat and pull at one ninety eight. Yeah. Uh, five 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 is not a bad place to be. I know when uh, uh, there's something on the top shelf. <laughs> 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 That's not where you want to be. Sorry, man. Uh, but uh, you know, le- lever- hey, leverage wise, less. leverage wise, that may not be a bad deal. That's right. Yeah, don't uh, don't 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 worry about that. And uh, your four twenty five pull ain't too bad. I don't know how long you've been doing this, but uh, you know you can do six hundred. You can get there, maybe. What percentage of people can get to us? What percentage of men can get to a six hundred pound pull? 
Um, if they start in their 20s or early 30s, you mean? Yeah. I bet probably, if they trained hard, I bet 25%. Oh, you're fucking nuts. You don't think so? You no. think it's way less than that? Yeah, I think it's 5 to 10. Mm, I bet it's higher than that. Like, I think you could have pulled 600 pounds if you had started at 24. Yeah, I think so. Well, I think so. But I'm a good puller. I ain't good at anything else. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Hard to tell. Yeah, it's hard to tell. <laughs> hard to tell. Hard to tell. I don't know. I feel like 600 is one of those things that I definitely think, would you would you agree that over 50%, well over 50% of men could pull 500 plus if they trained, if they if started they, early enough and trained long enough? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Half, half of dudes, if they start at 18, given the fullness of time and the proper dedication, can pull in 500 or more. Yeah. I think I, I, I think, think that's I would probably true. say well more than half. If you're talking about starting at 18, I don't know, man. Anyway, who knows? The problem is that most of our listeners are 47, right? <laughs> and so, and so, what are you going to do? The question is: is will is will will you or I ever pull 500 pounds again? That is the question. Oh yeah, I'll pull 500 here later later this year. Okay. What will you? I think I can pull 500 on my worst day. Right now, I'm so detrained right now. Yeah, I told you last week I was having the sciatic nerve pain stuff. Still am. Just oh man, I just load it up and my hip closes enough. It just shocks me. Yeah, and I can't push with my right leg. So I'll be like, okay, rack pull time. That's what we do. And uh, two sixty five rack pulls. We're just straightening my fingers out. I'm so detrained and weak, and <laughs> I've been funny. so sick for so long. Matt goes, that's funny. <laughs> I have a movement. I have a movement I need to do. So we, we should get off this call. When we get off the call, uh, you should go out in your garage. I can show you a thing that I think will really help that sciatic nerve pain. With the, You've got some bands, right? Like yeah. the green band, the mid- medium green band. I gotta, I, I'll tell you, I've got this thing I learned how to do that it just really helps that sciatic nerve. I don't want to tell all our listeners. No, but screw those guys. No, it's, it's hard to explain. I've tried to explain it to online Clients for you basically you sit on the floor with your feet straight out in front of you and you push your rump back as close as you can to the to the base of the wall so mm-hmm. that your so okay. that your back is straight against the wall and your legs are straight against the floor and you take is there I assume it's hurt that side of nerve pains I assume is on one leg yeah, not it's both the right, it's the right one yeah so what you do is you you put the band around your right foot you loop it around your right foot mm-hmm. like it's a the reins of a horse but the horse head is your foot. And so you're holding both ends of the the rein of the band, okay. and you can pull on the right side of the of the band, and that will turn your foot out. Okay, right. And then what you're going to do is you're gonna you're gonna force your foot to rotate in against the band, and mm, then let it come out, and then in against the band, and let it come out in against the band. You do that ten times, slow and smooth, and then you're going to pull on the inside portion of the band, which will turn your foot to the left. And then fight and back. And you do the opposite, and you'll work against it, work against it, work against it. And there's something about, I know this term isn't real. Please don't yell at me, PTs and whatnot. But that idea of sort of flossing the nerve, I think what it's letting that stuff do is it's sort of like putting everything in place and and letting the nerve kind of move freely in in within the muscle tissue there. Uh, because probably what's happening is you've got some sort of inflammation there that's For sure. pushing rightly, you know, right there. And I, I, man, I'll tell you every what I time did. I do that, it helps a lot. I sat on a tractor looking over my shoulder for about four hours. <laughs> oh, that's what did it? I think so. Because yeah, you were looking backwards. Off. Right. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. everything, well, most of the time, everything you're doing is behind you and you're like all hunkered around, weird, sure. you know. But that's a, hey, thanks, coach. No problem. Let's see it. Let's, I'll, I'll, we can do FaceTime if you want to. I'll walk you through it, make sure. But I think I got it. I'll, I'll, I'll video it and send you a video. Yeah, that'd be, be like thumbs up. It helps or, a lot. I'm telling you. Uh, Travis says, training athletes and the four-day split. That's the subject line. He says, okay. first off, thanks for the master class. It is the best I have heard. Hopefully you can get some shirts in the f- in the fit me so I can grab one or a few to support. In to fit me. Okay, in to fit me. We By the way, we just loaded up new no shirts. Smalls. We've got no smalls. No smalls. I assume the guy's probably a 2XL or something, but I literally we just posted like a 1,000 shirts on the website. I had a huge order come in, plus the new hats. And uh, so you can go to barbellogic.com and get those. Yeah, you got that merch. I just picked up a little piece of merch for online great books. Uh, nobody can buy this, but it's a cool story. <laughs> okay. Let's hear it. So I'm not going to make any money from telling this, but it's a cool story. Our members need like a, uh, they need a, uh, a timeline, 
like uh, who was first, Plato or Confucius, and and when was mm. when was the Peloponnesian War, and when was Jesus, yeah, like, and, like all that, because that stuff's kind of hard to piece together sometimes. And I've been looking for a long time for a, a like a big poster with like a history timeline on it. Yeah, and I found this one. World history chart. It is okay. the An Andreas Notiger world history chart found in a used bookstore. I'm like, this is it. This thing's beautiful. Comes with like a 50 page book, which is like a, just a crash course in history. And then this full pit color, like giant yeah. poster of timelines of like wars and you important can't, people. You can't hear your microphone. You put that thing between, well, put that thing between your face and the microphone. <laughs> uh, it's got this timeline of like wars and important people and inventions, just all this stuff. So I'm like, I'm going to buy these. They're out of print. Right. But I found the man's website, and it says, if you're interested, mail me, P.O. Box, blah, 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 Perfect. Canada. He's pulling a Brett McKay there. So I wrote him a letter, licked the stamp, sent it to him. He mailed me back. And he's like, well, I don't really care about that shit anymore. I'm 87 or whatever. <laughs> he says, but I've got, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a thousand of them in my garage. I, they're the only the ones that exist. You want them? And he's like, you want them? I said, you bet. So I wrote him a letter back that said, you bet. <laughs> and then he wrote me a letter back where to send the money. And then I sent him the money in the letter. And uh, it won't be long and we're going to have these. But, uh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, the maybe, guys maybe. doing cocaine and hookers at 87. He'll probably die. He'll money. probably just die when he opens the... <laughs> uh, but I'm super, I'm super excited. And I think I'm actually going to get the rights to republish this thing. It's the best That'd one be I've cool. ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> We did it. Did I tell you that we did it the other night? We had a uh, my nieces, my my sister's daughters, twins. Um, they're a year younger than Kaylin. They they did a sleepover, and we did a we walked through American history in fifteen points. Did I tell you this? Uh huh. And so I was asking them. I used to do this all the time as a teacher. I would say like, Hey, hey kids, junior high kids, fourteen, fifteen years old. You know, can you tell me within a hundred years of when the Civil War was? Hmm. And they they can't no, public school kids can't so so Kaylin could she did answer most of them correct my wife I made my wife take it at the same time so we did a little tr history trivia sleep overnight so mm. I made my wife take it so there's like twenty questions Rachel went twenty for twenty the only one she kind of missed was who was the main enemy in World War One yeah that's not exactly clear right and <laughs> so and I was pushing for Germany because I wanted to explain. I wanted to explain the Treaty of Versailles and the problem with, you know, post, anyway, the leading up to World War II. But uh, we, so we basically walked through that and then they didn't, and they didn't know any major, I mean, the public school, they struggled and they're smart kids. They're like in gifted, the gifted classes and stuff. And so I was like, you should kind of know when the Revolutionary War was and Civil War, and who the bad guy was in World War II, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So then we walked through, what you we know, did is I said, what was the biggest thing that we started at 1750 to 1800? And I said, in those 50 years, what's the most important thing that happened? And then 1800 to 1850, 1850 to 1900. And then we went by decade, 1900 to 1910, 1910 to 1920, 1920 to 1930. And, we, and I said, look, I bet we can pick out one or two big things that happened in, in this decade. And it's kind of everything you would ever need to know about American history. You, you've got it. And so in 15 points, they kind of had it all. They yeah. were like, oh, it was, you know. This is what it was World War I, it was the Roaring Twenties, and then we had Prohibition, and, and we had and Great Depression, and, you know, and you just kind of walk, and then World War II, and the Roaring 1950s, and the Cold War, and we landed on the moon, and JFK got, JFK got killed first, and then we landed on the moon, you know, all that, and you just kind of walk through the thing, and they're like, oh, now this makes sense, because you start asking, and you're, they're like, uh, like, what war was going on when, when Rachel and I were born, and they were like, uh, I don't know, like, World War II, or the Korean War? The Falklands. Like, or like, yeah. Who was the enemy in World War II? They'd be like, the Native Americans? That's what one of them said. <laughs> Always. Like, uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So we did 15 points of, the Amer of American history. <laughs> so, yeah, it was fun. All right. So how's that for squats and squat talk? Yeah. I sent out a thing to online great books people about Aristotelian revolutions. Uh-huh. So all of book five of Aristotle's politics is about revolution. Okay. And uh, for, for Aristotle, it's not just when, like, everybody strings the politicians up from the lamppost. It's not always that. He's just like, he says, it's when the material conditions of the political environment change. And that can be war, but it can also be, like, famine and disease, and it could be more frequently. It's like a change in who gets the franchise. Like, if you change who votes, the government's going to change. Sure. And you might call it the same thing, but it's going to be quite, quite different. 
uh, so I sent out this thing. I said, how many Aristotelian-style revolutions have taken place in the United States from July 5th of 76? You must Good name it. You must name at least 12. That'd be awesome. That'd be fun. Yeah. So think about since seven, 1776, right. what changes in the political environment have resulted in entirely different political outcomes than would have been pre- available previous? Yeah. You have to come up with 12. Oh, dude, there's 25. So, oh, I'm sure there's tons. Sure. One, we overthrew the Articles of Confederation. Right. Yeah, 1789, they threw out the Articles of Confederation and put in the Constitution. Bloodless right. Revolution, whatever. Sure. Uh, they took out the property qualification for voting. It used to be his only property owners. I was going to say, property, that out, property I changed owners. it. Uh, we know about the uh, the unfortunate conflict. Should bring that back? Yeah, of course. Um, okay. The unfortunate conflict, that one, on and on and on. I mean, there, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, sure, but you know, it's the freest country in the world, right? Oh, back to a question. We had questions here. Travis says, if my athletes get to a four day split and and the primary stressor is intensity, I feel there could be a point where the main goal becomes volume to prepare for the season, even before moving to specificity for their sport. Am I wrong in thinking this? What would that look like? I don't think you're wrong in thinking that, but I'll let Matt go. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a time, there's a time for everything, right? So the thing is, is that there, you can, with athletes who are in a sports season, it actually creates sort of a simpler calendar for you. The, the hard part with athletes, a lot of athletes, is they play multiple sports. And so they're always playing sports. So the first problem you end up with is when is the actual off season? Because often those athletes are playing all the time. And so, you're sort of trying to, in a neat world, they, and I don't think this is actually best for high school kids, they play a sport and they get done with that sport. They're sort of beat up, but they're 16, so it doesn't take long to get better. And you go through the postseason, which is get them big, get them strong, get them stronger, get them stronger, and then start to do some work to make them a little faster. And then you start practicing for preseason when the new season comes around inevitably what happens is they play sports year round because that's the way sports, even if they only play one sport, a lot of these one sport athletes, they play in all these different leagues. Right. There's, so, there's three years. weeks so, a year. So your soccer player doesn't play soccer. That's right. So you basically end up training kids. You don't really think of it this way, but you basically end up training kids in a concurrent system where you're actually all, all the time training for strength, training for some sort of hypertrophy, doing some sort of speed work or dynamic work or power work, power cleans, things like that. And then they're also practicing for their sport or playing their sport. And honestly, it's not that big of a deal when they're 17, right? When they're when the guy's 42, you just can't do mm-hmm. that. They can't. This is the one of the problems that you and I see all the time with clients at Block. Is you know you'll talk to some executive and he's like, "Boy, I sure do like my men's league basketball on Tuesdays and Thursdays." Like, well, I mean that's a trade off, right? But it probably isn't a trade off at 17. It's not much of one. No. And so um, you know, I mean, he's he, listen. You're thinking correctly. In a perfect world, it works. The problem is, is that teenagers rarely operate in a perfect world, and so probably you're going to train them for both. So what I'll what I'll tend to do is I'll just I'll just do the same thing I do with a lot of my clients. You you basically have them hit that first top set in the same workout. You could actually here's what you can do. Let me let, let me give you an example. In one workout, you could have your athletes work up to a heavy power clean single, and then you could have them drop five percent, and you could have them do four more singles. Or you could have them do a few triples at power clean. So you, you you get the power work in. At that point, you could actually then just put the bar down. Let's say they power cleaned up to 225. You put some weight on the bar and you deadlift 225 and 275 and 315 and then 365. And they end their deadlifts at 365 for a triple. And then you can back them off to 315 and you do three more sets of five at 315. Now in about a 35-minute period, they've power cleaned, they've deadlifted heavy, and they've deadlifted for volume, Right. And then you could go in and you could squat for three sets of five and you could get some good strength and hypertrophy work from the squat. And then you could let them get a drink, rest for five minutes and take them out and you could condition their ass. <laughs> and they're 17 and it works. And the next day they're better. Yeah. Like it, it just, it, that's, that's my experience as a strength coach for 10 years said like, if you just do kids, kids will adapt. Kids will recover because they're kids. Yeah. Like, he says in here, in this sentence, again, we don't have enough of the info here to really know what's going on, but he says, I'll read it again. I feel there could be a point where the main goal becomes volume to prepare for the season. 
dude, I don't know what the season is that you're talking about, but we just, I won't say we, I just have my people do volume when they can't do enough high intensity work to get the hypertrophic effect that they need to get the strength PR. I don't have anybody do volume anything in preparation for any athletic season. Well, it's not the same thing, right? right? Like what you're, there is no way to prepare unless you're preparing for powerlifting your strongman. <laughs> if that's the athletic season, then it works. But if you're preparing for football or soccer or something like that, there's no way to prepare for the season with anything that you do in the right. weight room. You just, you, what you do in the weight room puts on muscle and gets strong. You, you, you structural right. adaptation. You move the weights to get stronger. And that's right. I only have them do enough volume that, the, you know, to keep to getting, getting stronger, stronger. To keep driving up stress to keep. I never stronger. do volume that's right. for volume sake. You know, somebody that's that's, that's advanced right. like Charity, it might ne- mean that she has to do th- literally twelve or fourteen weeks of volume work to go get a PR in a f- five or six months from now. But she's yeah. not doing volume work to prep for the season. She's doing it right. so that she can produce more force against the barbell. I, I think yeah, you got and some- that work capacity in the season is quickly gained and quickly lost, so you can actually. What I this was the hardest thing as a strength coach and the hardest thing that I had to deal with in, as a strength coach is we get an off season. You know, football ends in November. The the football coaches usually give the kids off December. They would come in and lift some, but there's no conditioning or anything. They come in for spring semester in January, and the football coaches are like, "Boy, we just we just didn't have enough gas in the fourth quarter. Let's start conditioning the kids in January." I'm like, "Football season doesn't start till late August. What are you talking yeah. about? How long does it take to get in condition for a sport? Say football." A, a month at the most, maybe <laughs> it doesn't take very long. And so it's, and you know, and then how do you get into condition for the season? Well, you play the sport, you play the sport under the same duress or worse, higher stress than the, than the sport, than the actual competitive sport is going to call for. So, you know, that's how you do it. So for high school kids, especially high school kids and college kids, what you do in the weight room makes them bigger, stronger structural changes and what you do on the field brings about those inner that energy systems work, right? The metabolic pathways. That's what's trained there. You can't really train metabolic pathway very well in the weight room. You know, I, I kind of wish Travis was on here so we could get him to clarify a little bit. But I have a hunch that Travis just thinks that volume is just great at, in and of itself. But we don't do it just to do it. We do it so that we get stronger. Be careful with that stuff, yep. guys. Be careful with that. Uh, Florence. The email says Florence, but her, her name actually, and so she says, my name is Emily. This has got to be our 25th female listener. Is 19 years old, Excellent. 5'10 and 170 squ- 175, squatting 215 and pulling 240. I have hyperflexible shoulders, which is making it very difficult to engage my back. Don't say engage. And shoulders to get my chins. Are there any additional exercises I could do to strengthen and stabilize my shoulders. Dips are, dips are incredibly difficult for me. Presses and bench presses are definitely helping. I'm wondering if there are additional movements I could do to help. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the more muscle you put on, or put on around the shoulder girdle, then we, just as we talked about earlier, if you gain stability, you're going to lose some mobility, right? So as you gain muscle, you'll gain some stability, but you'll lose a little mobility, you know, degrees and what not gained. Um, so ultimately that that is a way to help. And then the other thing is with chins, a lot of people are you're probably just relaxing in the bottom. Right. It's not that you can't engage your back. It's that if you do a chin or a pull up in the bottom, you're not supposed to get loose and wiggly. You're not gonna be like gumby at the bottom of that. Just thing. think all elbow. You, you just think elbow. Yeah, it's elbows have to get straight and pull, but the actual shoulders don't go in full flexion and full extension. There's a little bit of like you're staying a little bit tight. Same thing on like you know on a on a bicep curl. If I do a, a barbell curl, I don't want to cheat the thing and not straighten my elbow. But at the same time, I don't want to straighten my elbow and then take a deep breath out and relax, and then try to start everything from a dead stop. Like a, a barbell curl doesn't start from a dead stop at the bottom. A chin doesn't start from a dead stop in the bottom after rep one. Right? You don't want to actually be loose in the bottom. So I don't know. Combination of learning how to control that. Tightness and putting on some muscle on your yeah, shoulder I bet helps. You're just not strong enough. Chins are really hard for She's ladies. Decently strong and, though. Well, she is. That's a good squat and that's a good pull. We don't have any bench press or press numbers here, and and uh, and you're you're tall, five foot ten. You probably got really long arms. There's a long range of motion there in that dip and in the chin. And 
you're probably just not strong enough in those. And I, I, I would just have you do lat pull downs, assisted chins, maybe barbell row. Uh, dips are going to be tough for a long time for you. Ladies, ladies really struggle with those dips. And uh, you'll get stronger and you'll be able to do them. I think the focus on engaging the back and shoulders is probably a red herring. You're probably just not strong enough. But to Matt's point, when you do your chins, don't go for a big, long stretch at the bottom. Don't try to make yourself long at the bottom. Well, period. The end. Uh, but chances yeah. are... Just straighten the elbows. Chances, pop right back yeah. down. The chances are you're just not quite strong enough to uh, hold it all together there at the bottom. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for thanks for listening. Good. Matt and Scott, I wonder if you could recommend the top 10 most important Barbell Logic podcasts you've done for someone new. Oh, he did this. <laughs> he asked me this. Yeah. That's his way of saying, I don't want to listen to all 300. Can you give me the important 10? What's the short the list? The first 10. It, it really probably is. Yeah, I think it is. First 10 and MED, like not just the MED class, but if you'll go through any, like if you listen to any of the ones that say MED, MED toolbox episodes, those are real important. And then we have the Getting Started series too, which is maybe maybe right. six shows or something like that. So that's not the yep. 10 top, that's not the top 10. That's eight in the MED series, I think. Six and the getting started, and then the first ten shows. Yep. But uh, that'll give you that'll give you some idea. I don't know. Uh, Theo Theo says, "Hi guys, love the podcast. Thanks for the quality information and lively entertainment." He says, "For, for what it's worth, I agree with Scott that Matt does not know how to wipe properly." He says, I've been training for almost two years with a, a coach, and he was great. I'm stronger than I thought possible. I'm 29, 6'4", 220. I squatted 390 and deadlifted 475 uh, lately, and we'll be breaking through those numbers soon. Good. Yeah. He says, what constitutes good feedback to my coach? What is the line between feedback and whining? What does my coach need to know to help him help me? Then he says, for example, pause squats rep, wreck my hip flexors. That's something my coach should know, but feeling generally beat up after several hard weeks of training, do I keep that to myself and suck it up? Hmm. This is a very <laughs> difficult question. You, yeah, it is kind of difficult. Certainly when something is painful and hurts, you, you should report that to your coach. The thing that often doesn't get reported to us is the stuff outside the weight room that needs to be reported. Right. Like, oh, I didn't get any sleep last night because my kid was throwing up all night long or I had a fight with my wife or, or you know, I got the pink slip at work or whatever that that stuff is stuff i always want to know um you know if somebody feels generally beat up i i like a client to say hey this may be the goal i just want to let you know i feel generally beat up mm -hmm. everything's kind of achy and i'm sort of unmotivated that's the thing i want to hear the thing that i don't like to hear as a as a as a coach is when it feels like and a lot of this is just the way it's worded when a client words a question like they're questioning the way i'm programming them you know, if they say, uh, I, like, I, I have clients that just be like, why do we do it this way? Question. You're like, well, I mean, you could have still asked that in a way that doesn't, <laughs> didn't make me get defensive. Right. You know, I mean, we're all like humans, too. If you're going to just kind of act like you're not happy about it, then. So to me, that's, does that, is that fair? Wait, man, uh, do you have suggestions there? Uh, I, mean, it's just, I, I don't mind them asking, why are you doing it this way? I, I, I don't mind. But when they. I have some clients that if they have a suggestion, I need to listen. I've got some guys I've had a long time and know know themselves sure. very well, and um, uh, and I, I bet McKay is like that for you. If McKay ever told you, "Hey, listen, uh, instead of doing five, I need to do two triples next Tuesday," that's that's probably right. But ninety seven percent of my clients, when they have a suggestion, they need to. They're probably not right, and uh, I'm the same way. If I program for myself, by the way, it's not just they're not as smart sure. as me. It's just we tend to not have enough objectivity when it's us carrying the weight on our back. Um, I want to know. I want to know if somebody if somebody has an emergent ache or pain, um, like sure. if their elbows are starting to ache in the evening. I need to know before that uh, sure. before that tendonitis takes off. I can normally see uh, if they're feeling generally beat up. I can normally see it in the bar speed. If I've been coaching them long enough, I know enough about them, I can tell. And if they tell me that, that's okay too. That's that's not not helpful, but I can normally see that. So I, I, I want to know about specific aches and pains that are coming up. Uh, and I particularly want to know about, among my disciplined clients, lack of enthusiasm for training, 
and just difficulty doing the program. You know, if you go yeah. back and listen to the show we did with uh, Tim Peterson, we called him the mechanic in that show. If Tim ever says that he's not excited about training and hasn't been for two or three sessions, that dude's overtrained. Something's up. Something's up. But that guy never misses training. That's right. Coached him for years. So this isn't a this isn't somebody on week seven of LP. That's right. You know, I just had a client quit not too long ago, and he never felt like it. It was constant bitching, constant second guessing. Sure. And he's never going to get strong, and everything that he thinks is wrong. And you know, from that guy, I couldn't listen to anything he said. He was literally. He was the story of the boy who cried wolf. Everything that sure. came out of his mouth was utter rubbish. Yeah, yeah. And, Hypochondriac uh, and just everything hurt. And then Debbie Downer and you get you get clients like that. So when so, what constitutes good feedback to your coach? You need to be honest. And when I say honest, don't just say everything that comes to your mind. You need to be. You need to evaluate the things that you're thinking about your training, and evaluate that against the idea that you might not be objective about it. And then tell the coach and don't try to color or convince it. Just say, these are the facts. My right elbow yep. was throbbing and it woke me up at 1 a.m. this morning. Yeah, by the That's way, it. one of the things I was going to say, this one of my biggest, not pet peeve, but thing that will help me tremendously is if, if there is a place that hurts, I need to know exactly where it hurts. So saying right. your right elbow hurts doesn't help me. Right. Because is that, what do you mean? Like you're bi you have bicep tendonitis or medial epicondyle or lateral epicondyle or tricep tendonitis. I mean, they're, they're, those Bryceps back to brachialis can be like there's all sorts of places it could be a, an issue there. So I need you to say right here hurts. Take a picture of it or exactly in this spot. As a matter of fact, that's that's a I had a guy the other day, a super busy guy, a CEO of an oil company, and he took a picture the other day and he pointed to the spot just above the tibial tuberosity on his right knee. He's like, hurts right here on the descent in the squat. Perfect. That's what I need I, to know. I know what that now is. I know. Now I know where it is. Not hey, my knee hurts. Right. That didn't help me any. Right. So is it patella tendonitis? Is it patella femoral pain? Is it quad tendonitis? There's all sorts of things that can happen. But when you point to the exact spot and say, this is where it hurts and this is when it hurts, mm -hmm. that, that's very helpful. Yeah. Just the facts. Just the facts, man. My elbow was throbbing. Take a picture of your elbow, draw right an X on it with an ink pen or point to it yeah. in your finger in the picture. And um, that, that, that kind of stuff is great. That, that client that left, by the way. Yeah. Utter disgust by Hambrick. Is by the a, way, if you, he was if a millennial. You, what if you, what if you have a real painful like hemorrhoid? You take a picture of it, draw it with an X, say this is the spot that hurts yes. in the very bottom of a squat. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I'll, uh, ha I'll have you. Do I got an inguinal models. hernia. I think I got an inguinal hernia right here. You picture. know, what, you know what my fix is for those hemorrhoids, though. Really, what is it? Espresso and palm olive enema. Just tune it right up. Is it? Why is that? No, I have no idea. But, okay. but this, this guy is a millennial, and he had gone to law school. He's probably going to listen to this. He'll be just furious, and that's okay. I actually like the guy, and I care about him, but but he had been a good student. This is my impression. He, uh, he had some kind of boomer helicopter parents, and he was a good student. And as such, he had been patted on the head and told he was such a smart boy for so very long, but hadn't actually done anything in the real world. He'd been completely cloistered in yeah. school and so on that uh, he thought – he overthought every single thing that he did – yeah. From applying to a job, a part-time job as a stalker at a grocery store, to whether or not he should do the LTEs I prescribed for him. And, and I told right. him, I was like, dude, you're not as fucking smart as you think you are. Like, you, you might have got A's and your mom told you you were a smart boy, but sure. you don't know shit from fat me. And you think about all the wrong things in all the wrong ways yeah, well, it's, all it's day. It's that common sense stuff. You, you meet people all the time, right? They're the guy is super academic, I'm sure, and has no common sense. No common sense. Because he never had to. He, he told me that he wasn't going to bench press because it didn't fit his values system. <laughs> and, I, and I said, Sorry. he did. And I said, well, I said, well, I can respect what that, but you're going to have to describe that to me in precise terms. Because if you're right about that, maybe I shouldn't either. That's right. I need to be convinced. Well, he finally comes around to saying, well, it spooked him and he didn't have a spotter. And he told me, he said, you know, when I get married and I have a wife that can spot for me, I'll bench again. And I said, well, if you don't bench more than 165, you're never going to fucking get married wife. anyway. Right. So, Clearly. you know, what are we going to do? Why don't we, why don't we learn how to set the safeties and let's how, let's endure a little peril and swing the bar out over our face with a load yeah. on it and let's go, you know, but it was constant stuff like that, you know, yeah. and as a result, and I care about that guy, I care about that kid and I want sure. good for him, but he'll never be strong. 
and he will never flourish. He he's going to be like an infant that they write on his de- uh, death certificate, just f- failure to thrive. <laughs> right. We I've had several guys like that. But the, he's the going to be eighty one. Those guys and die in bed, and the doctor is going to write <laughs> failure to thrive. That's right. Uh, of course, I I don't know this guy at all, and so as the owner of Block, I know you know I have no idea. I'm taking your word for it, but I have I have coached and trained many people that were just like this. One thing I've noticed is that these people are often the most gung ho when they start. They'll start and they'll be like, "I'm all in. I'm going to be the world's strongest man. I'm going to set world records." They've been a computer programmer for 20 years, and like I, you know, it's fine. I like mm-hmm. the enthusiasm and all, but you know, and then those are the people that are just like they get into that like week seven of LP and it starts to get hard. It's not even that hard. And they just, they can't hack it. They're just not, they're just not mentally tough enough to hack the thing, which is frustrating. You know, yeah. I've had my kids do quite a bit of manual labor lately. My kids have never really done manual labor. Like we do, we did the garden, lots of digging, hoeing up big rocks, you know, laying, laying, we put the massive six by six lawn timbers, eight feet long. Listen, a six by six by eight feet long timber, it's heavy. It's heavy. And, you know, digging it and put it down. And you could just see it was like it. It's like a whole new world for them mm-hmm. to, to hold garden tools. You know, it's just the same thing. And they're just <laughs> homeschool kids are just like, you know, worked on the computer their whole life. I love it. I'm sure you do, too. Like you got work on the farm. I mean, there's I'm not super excited about a 12 hour day of manual labor, but there's something that's very satisfying about getting done with that 12 hours of manual labor, looking at what you did, feeling that sense of accomplishment. I like the feeling of coming home and being real tired. Like physically oh, sleep tired good. from where we yeah. work. I'm going to take a shower. A shower feels good. Your hands are kind of beat up and blistered. You eat a good meal. You know, you sit down on the, in the chair with your family for the night and you, you read and then you go to bed and God, it feels so good to crawl into bed on nights like that. Oh, yeah. It's just, I don't know. It's very satisfying to me. Or if you'd been in school from the, you know, your mom enrolled you in the, the pre-K program because she wanted nothing but the best for you. Right. And you've sat in a desk from age four until 26. Sure. Yeah, it's a problem. It's uh, it's not great. No. You know, the no. best way to prepare people for life is to throw them into it, by the yeah. way. Yeah. It's just like the best way to make your squat go up is to squat. Yeah. Hey, you're listening. I care about you. Get out of your head, man, and act. Every time that you start thinking about something, stop thinking and act. Don't just stand there. Do something. Yeah. <sighs> Because we're not talking about storm and machine gun nest. You don't have to be 100% By the way, right, man. You shouldn't think then either, though. That's right, the you thing. Stop to act. Yeah. There's, no, there's no time to think either then, right? Ugh. That's what Iceman says. You think you're dead. Brad says, MED Masterclass, Getting Started in Nutrition Recovery. Woo! There you go, Jared. Uh, he says, uh, <laughs> Those, those yeah. are the ones. Now, Brad says, uh, A few weeks ago, a buddy of mine told me to check out your MED podcast. It's awesome! He said, I've owned some of these books for a number of years, uh, so I already know some of the content you're covering, but this podcast is when I feel like I finally found Jesus. Now, wait a minute. But he says, I've never been able to... about this. (laughs) He says, I've never been able to visualize what happens after LP. It always seemed like, okay, I want to get as strong as I've ever been, but probably a bit too heavy, and then what? A bit too heavy. I guess you mean like your body weight. I don't know. And he says, anyway, the first few MEDs that walked through the evolution from LP to Texas method to a four-day split really opened my eyes and got me excited about lifting again. Uh, you're still thinking about it wrong, dude. You got to go listen to my two shows about MED where <laughs> you're still thinking about it wrong. No, seriously. Like, no, you don't, I know. You're you right. Don't, you're right. You don't you're change right. from this template. <laughs> right. Of course then, not. And then build a ramp into the next template. You make the change that you need to get the thing you want. And if That's it right. coincidentally at some point looks like a template that somebody else wrote, it's coincident you don't care. I mean, I, you're on the right road, but yeah. it's still not quite the Hambrickian conception of the thing. Hambrickian. Says, That's right. He says, I doubt that I'll be able to run it 8 to 12 weeks of this LP he's talking about, uh, but it seems silly to start as if I haven't been lifting recently. So he said his recent five rep mic squat is 235, and I'm planning to start LP around 205 or so. No, no, no. Wait that, a minute. It's, it's a girl. What's no, his name? His name's Brad. He's 40 years old. Oh, Brad Brad feels like a guy's name. Uh, uh, he's 40 uh, years old, 6'2", and weighs 190. Okay. Bro, you're you're going to be able to run it for a while. <laughs> yeah. You got a ways. You got a ways to go. Yeah, dude, I, when I started my first LP at 6'2", and around 190, 
And I was probably 38 and I ran it out to about 305 and not talented at all in the squat. I think my, not only not talented, the least talented squatter I've ever coached. Yeah, it's Scott it's bad. Uh, my, my deadlift, I think I ended up my deadlift at about 405 or something like that for five, though. My deadlift went, went quite a bit ahead of that. So just do but your, if you understand the concepts with this guy, you know, if the guy actually has paid attention in the MED class and in, in your prequel classes, which kind of lay the groundwork for that, is that. You just do the LP until the LP stops working, and then you make the change, a change, and you run that till it stops working, and you make a change until mm-hmm. it stops working. You don't need to, you don't need to make any sort of like, you don't, you don't need to have the foresight or try to have the foresight in how long LP is going to last. Right. You have to be like, mm, I think it'll probably because I already trained before. My LP is only going to last seven weeks. Don't do that. Yeah, I hope just it lasts forty nine weeks. Working. Yeah, maybe it lasts forty nine weeks. Like, what yeah, are you going to even say awesome. that? That's right. That's right. Maybe squat 605. Back to the question about being a good client. I really dislike when a client wants to set goals, like particular numbers for particular lifts. Right. I just want to hit PRs. You know, I think it's good for a a man in particular. You know, women have their own numbers, but let's say for the guy, the 200, 300, 400, 500 benchmarks. I think, okay, to say that those are your goals for the intermediate period, is is, that's great. But if you're like this year... This year, I'm going to squat 410. This training cycle. Yeah. Uh, no, your goal should always be. So if you want to be a great client, your goal should always be to not miss a session. That's yeah. it. That's, That's it. True. And That's if the true. programming's good and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you will you hit, hit any PR. goal that you would ha- that you would have reasonably set. So, so don't worry about how long your LP is going to last. I'm going to read all of this last chunk. Hey, let here. me tell. You, I'll tell you another one that actually really bothers me. Mm-hmm. When people try to change the layout of the programming that I have. Like you ever have somebody where you're like, listen, I know the person's schedule. I know when they work. You know, I've got you set up to train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, let's say. And they're like, um, can I can I train instead Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday? I'm like, listen, I put this, I, yes, we can talk about it. And I, the answer is almost always yes, I'll change it because I want them to do it. But I'm like, what are we changing? And then they're like, hey, can I change... Instead of doing um, the heavy bench press on Monday, could I do the volume bench press on Monday and do the heavy bench press on the Friday? I'm like, listen, there's a reason I set it up this way. There's a reason I set it up this way. They keep trying to change the layout of the workouts, both on the day they're supposed to be trained. So, you know, and and then then they'll train their way. So I'm like, listen, sure, you know, you're the paying client. So yes, I, I mean, it's not, and it's not a, what you're asking is not an egregious error. So there's times I'll be like, sure, I want you to train. And they'll get in there like, man, I got two heavy bench presses back to back on Saturday right. and Monday. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, you changed the schedule on me. You're an intermediate like I lifter. I had it set up for you so you wouldn't have this issue. Yep. You're an intermediate lifter. Your last bench of the of last week was heavy, and I had you doing volume on your first bench of this week, and now you want to change it. You're going to do heavy back to back. It's right. your fault. I know. I get this all the time. Ah, poor uh, Brad. Poor Brad says, We'll get back to Brad. He says, these podcasts are really great, and I find myself proselytizing for you guys. Thank you. He says, my question, I'm experiencing, I've experienced with tracking calories and macros, but all I've really done is cut, and then you run out of energy and workout suffer, and you give up. He says, I'm 40, I'm six foot two, and my weight is right at 190. I had a DEXA recently, which pegged me at 25%, and had my visceral fat as just over the cusp of healthy and increased risk. Anyway, I'm listening to your nutrition podcast, and my biggest question is, how does one decide what category they fit in? I assume he means healthy or increased risk. Yeah, right, right, right. I don't think it is as straightforward for me as to whether I'm underweight or overweight. My sense is that you guys uh, would probably tell me I need to gain 20 pounds. On the other hand, I have DEXA results tell me I need to lose weight. Your DEXA results aren't saying fucking shit to you. That's right. It's, it's, <laughs> you're yeah, interpreting. That's right. That's right. Or your doctor that read them, is a, he doesn't get to. He doesn't right. get to make moral justifications. He says, plus, I do want to be leaner for vanity as well as health. So I'm finding myself like listening to your guy. podcast. Can I say that? I know it's a podcast. I know I'm a service company. I just don't like this guy. Brad. I like him. Listen, Brad, I don't Brad's, like Brad. Brad's new is to Brad this. Is Brad the guy you were just talking about that no. overthinks everything? <laughs> oh, listen. <laughs> but listen. that I'll Brad some does emails over, out. Brad some... overthinks everything. Brad, you need to get stronger. You need to put on weight. Listen, if you... <laughs> If you have the exact same amount of fat on your body today that you have on your body two months from now, but you gain 10 pounds of muscle, your body fat went down. Right. It's that simple. And listen, so you're, you said 20 pounds. And the answer is, I think I would like you to gain 20 pounds, but I'm not going to give you a goal of 
just gain 20 pounds. Sure. I want you to train hard, do the stuff I program for you, eat properly, and it's probably going to take you 18 months or two years to gain 20 pounds. You're an older guy, and I'm going to get you through LP, and then you're going to be an intermediate for almost that entire period of time, and the weight gain is going to be slow. Your waist will probably stay just about the same, but your waist will be comprised of a whole lot thicker abs and a whole lot more muscle on your back, so the visceral fat will go away. And, by the way, bad news, everybody. When us dudes get over 40, the visceral fat comes, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. If you want to starve yourself to make all of your fat go away, you can do that, but you're going to starve yourself, and you're going to lose muscle mass, too. Yeah, uh, There's something about aging. Man, in the last year, my body has changed a lot. Like There's something that happened in this last year in terms of aging that just... I felt the same from like 38 to 44, 36 sure. to 44. And like in the last year, I it, things have changed. Stuff beats yeah. me up a little bit more. Uh, I, I'm I, looking my, forward my to My belly's a little rounder. When I'm 45. And uh, I can't eat as much. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just more difficult. Uh, I've got a client um, who is a physician. He's 6'4". He's weighing about 210. And, and he has been really, really concerned about that 40-inch waist number. You know, there's this, there's this lore out there that says that you have sure. a lot of comorbidity if a man's waist is over 40 inches. And that's probably true. But what if you're actually six foot four? Like, right. what is the average guy's height? What is it, 5'9"? Yeah. So a, four, a six foot four guy with a 40-inch waist and it's a 455 deadlift, a, like, how right. much meat is on the guy's waist? It's not the guy same that's thing. Five, eight. With the same, yeah, the same, yeah. Uh, I I've got pretty big shoulders, pretty big back, got a pretty decent deadlift, and I've done this before with clients, with the in person clients, and they're talking about that. I'm they're I'm like, what do you think my waist measurement is? They're like thirty two. I'm like, no, it's thirty nine. Right. It's you know the proportions don't hold. Sure. You know, I started training. I don't know if you know this. I started training Pewter. Pewter. Doctor Pewter signed up, and I've been coaching him. That guy is huge. Yeah, he's like his frame is massive. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's like six six or something. He's real tall, say so maybe six seven, six 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 seven. He's just, he's just that guy's never gonna have a thirty seven inch waist. Never. He's six foot seven, and he's big. He's broad shouldered, and he's big hipped. It's eight inches around his vertebrae. <laughs> I know it's crazy. So yeah, so you got to understand the middle of the bell curve thing. So Brad, I take it back. I like, I could like you. There's, there's, <laughs> there's the potential for me to like you. Stop overthinking it. Just train, man. Train. You know, eat right, don't eat a bunch of crap, but you don't need to be cutting right now in the middle of this thing. You just need to train and get strong. Don't worry about cutting. I had a new client come in to Scott a couple weeks ago. Guy I really like, I think I can say his first name. He's a good guy. His name's Cliff. And uh, gosh, he's super coachable for a for a newbie. The guy's mm. just like, his squat was like, mm, he never really squatted. And he's like, I don't really know what I'm doing. And his squat was like 93% correct on the first workout after watching the, the videos. And uh, he's just done a, done a real good job. But on about the fifth or sixth workout, he's like, you know, so, kind of same sort of thing. He's like, ah, uh, you know, I feel like I need to lose a little bit of fat. Would it be okay if I continue this LP and started a cut? I was like, mm -mm. nope, sorry, dude. And so I was like, the day that day will come. We'll do that, but not right now. We got we this is the only chance we get to do this. And so I don't want you to get fat. Don't want you to don't want your waist to go up six inches in this process. That would be that would that would be overboard. Yep. But we're not going to cut and eat subcaloric while trying to do LP for the very first time. You just can't. You can't do that stuff. You know, for people who aren't taking drugs, this body recomposition—that's kind of a word I don't like—but that's what we're talking about here. Sure. Um, this body recomposition stuff is a long-term project, and so, so, so for Brad here, I, you know, I think you're looking at 18 months, two years before you really need to be, before you can get where you want to be on this. Um, for my obese clients, I tell I often tell them, or ask them. I say, "How long? How long did it take you to gain this weight?" Oh gosh, you know, I had a kid, and uh, I had a kid in twenty twelve. It's twenty right. eight years. I'm like, yeah, it's going to take you eight years to get what you want. Then, <laughs> right? That, that's not good salesmanship, but I ain't lying. You know, no. so if you look at your your DEXA number and your 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 dork doctors like, oh, you need to get this under twenty five percent. You need to get down to eighteen. Like, yeah, maybe I agree, but it's going to take a while. 
That's not something, sure. you know, it's April right now. Actually, it's almost May. It's May, let's say. That's not going to happen by Thanksgiving if it's going to last and if you're going to be a different kind of person. It's going right. to take a little while. So uh, maybe you ain't wrong, but you need to slow your roll. You need to get real strong. You need to focus on putting on muscle mass and eating properly. And by and by, you will get the things that you want from this. Yep. Good Lord. We're going slow today. Let's do one more here. Hey, this is my friend Levi again. What's up, Levi? Uh, Levi says, I currently have the cheapest rack and weights I could buy a year ago. The wife didn't believe I'd stick with it, but after a year of unwavering dedication, I've been cleared to buy good equipment. I have a Texas Power Bar. What rogue rack would you recommend? I'm thinking one of the Monster Light racks. They all start to look alike. I also want calibrated weights. What weights would you recommend? Um, yeah, remember, this guy emailed us some time ago, and he's like, I want to bench 405, and he had a pretty strong bench anyway. And uh, uh-huh. we were talking, yep. we, we gave him some pretty practical advice. He said he just benched 365 and it's moving right nice. on up. Uh, what road rack would you recommend, Matt? Dude, it doesn't matter. An, R- no. <laughs> an R3, an R4, an R6, an RML, a, a monster. Listen, Rogue doesn't make any bad racks. Buy any rack at Rogue. You buy a rack at Rogue to fit the space you have. I would buy the biggest, most badass rack there is at Rogue if you've got the money in the space. But if you're like, I think the R3 is the most basic, wonderful rack ever made. I think that's an incredible rack. It's three feet deep. That's why you know, I don't R3. think they even actually make that anymore. I think oh, they, they don't? I, I think they call it the RML3, I think. But it is. That's the Monster Light. I'm sorry. The yeah. RML, the Monster Light 3. Um, that's so, a great... That's a great... I, I like them. I like racks that are four feet deep because when you go from three feet to four feet, you can actually train two people at the same time in the rack. Yeah, that's the reason I like it. But if you're the only person that's going to train in it, uh, a three foot rack is perfectly fine. Everything that Rogue makes is good. They don't make a bad rack. All the racks are good. So they've got a two by three channel, and they've got a three by three. Right. Right. And uh, my, what's the my, two by three called now? Uh, Infinity, I think. Okay, it's still the Infinity. I think it's yeah. inf- Infinity. But I thought that was what the R three originally was. It was. I think okay. it was. Well, okay, here's the R3 rack. Okay, they got okay. it. R3 power rack. Uh, it's on their website right now for $6.95. That is the, uh, that's the smaller tubing. I highly recommend the smaller tubing versus the heavier one. I've had it people, doesn't squ- matter. I've had people sure. squat 800 out of my, R, R, my oh, R3. That, Listen, yeah, their R3 will hold, any, hold 1,500 pounds on that Anything thing. anybody wants to do. That's right. And, but here's the good thing about it. All of the accessories are cheaper, and they're not yes. as heavy. Right. Like you got the spotter arms for the big rack, they weigh thirty five pounds a piece, and you got to store yep. them and put them somewhere. Yeah. And then if you ever want to get anything like the uh, the mono lift attachment or whatever, oh, that, I have that for my that thing's three. a beast. It's so heavy, and when I, and of course you know they're so long that the pin you got to put it in the mono lift attachment is yeah. real high. Uh, by the way, I had a client get that for me. Thank you very much. I, I it's all I use. I love it, especially I love it for. Um, for like my Buffalo Duffalo bar. Oh, all that stuff's I really great. like it. It's awesome, but, <laughs> but so heavy. Lord, that stuff's it's heavy. Crazy heavy. And the the uh, the uh, the accessories like the Matador for dips and all that stuff are lighter, yeah, all bigger, all heavier and, for the and big one. All of it's over engineered, so you're good to go with the two by three. So that that's what I say about it. Um, and he says, and as far as calibrated weights, I wouldn't buy calibrated weights just Me by their comp- competition bumpers. They're half of the I, price. Listen, I, it's, it's, I like the black, the ones I have, I like better than the competition bump- bumpers. Yeah, Those black, what are my black ones called? The black rogue training bumpers. I think they're training. They, they, have, they still have the metal hub in the middle, just like the competition bumpers, but they're, they're, they're all black plates. They've got the writing on them is red or blue, and they've got a stripe down the middle of it. So it's like for the 25 kilo, or the, or the I don't have kilos, I've got the, the pounds, the 55 pound, the 45 pound, the 25 pound. I don't buy any 35s. So it's worthless. Uh, but I love those training plates. And they're just like the training bumpers, I think, the black. Yeah, they're called, Matt has the Rogue Black Training Plates. And they are, they are cheaper than the full color ones that I have, which yeah. they call the cut competition bumpers. And mats are better than mine because the lip around the edge of them is deeper and they're easier to hold on to. Yep, but mine, if you, but mine if you are get slick the, as snot, man. You can still put eight hundred pounds on the thing with the with the fifty fives. Yep. So it's it's not like you're the, the problem with the the wide bumpers is you can only get four hundred five on it. If you deadlift four hundred five, which you should, this guy benches three sixty five already. Oh. So I'm sure he he deadlifts over four hundred five. Then you can't get enough weight on. So yeah, they're just those the black training bumpers with the middle hub metal hub in the middle. I love those plates. Yeah, I love them. Great. The, the the little metal hub doesn't stretch out like it, like yeah. the shitty hubs in the 
old the prison iron, prison plates, prison yeah. bumpers. Um, so they fit tight on the bar. Weight tolerance plus or minus fifteen grams. That's like three paper clips. That's so crazy. It's not a calibrated plate, but none of Close us will enough. ever know the difference. No. Uh, and I tell you, I love Rogue. We talked about how great they are. They screw something up, they fix it. First of all, they don't screw up, but if they do, they make it right. Yep. And eat it all. But the fringe, the fringe training bumpers like yours are pretty yep. darn good and just no, I agree. and a little bit cheaper even yet. Uh, and, and, you know, I haven't heard anybody, I've heard people gripe about Titan. Sure. I, I personally have had a few little complaints with rep. Right. But I haven't heard anybody had any trouble with fringe other than they were out yeah, of stock. Yeah, really all of those companies are pretty solid. The, the thing no, that you Titan's have to understand is POS. Well, Rogue, the, well, what you're paying for though is Rogue. Rogue is made in America at Rogue in That's Ohio. Right. And so if you have a problem, they're also the guys making the thing. Right. Where these other companies, the reason they're cheaper is because they are outsourcing that stuff to China. So especially in today's world where Have you know, we like, figured that out that that's not a great idea. <laughs> that viruses viruses just come out of those countries sometimes and it becomes real hard to get stuff, then all of a sudden it's it's you know, you gotta wait you gotta wait for your stuff is on a barge out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to get here. And it's uh that's one of the other reasons that Rogue is worth it. So yeah. Well, that's Levi. No, that's probably good for today. That's good. It's an yeah, hour we'll seven. <laughs> yeah, we, we answered two questions, I think. Two and a half questions. That's all right. They're coming for the banter. Is that what it is? The Bants? The Bants. Yeah. Well, there is another Barbell Logic uh, podcast. We answer your questions on Thursday, like we just did. If you want your question in there, you better email it, because if you don't email it, I won't know. Don't go leave a review. Don't. Listen, don't do it. But here's what I want you to do this time. You can go to Spotify now, and there's a button on there. You can pick an episode of a podcast, and we're on Spotify, and you can hit the share button and share it to your Instagram story. There you go. And when you do that, you'll share it to all, with all your friends, and that would be a big help to us. So go would share a Spotify, share that Spotify episode, uh, an episode of Barbell Logic on Spotify yeah. to your Instagram your favorite story. episode. Yeah, tag us in it, and uh, we'll give you a shout back. All right? We'll do it. Thank you all.